Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. Aviation. That word means different things to different people. To some of you, aviation means that trip you're planning for your next vacation. Security lines, baggage handler, handlers tossing your luggage around like they were playing with bocce balls in the backyard. Layovers in strange crowded airports with fancy food courts. And seats that seem to be a holdover from some government interrogation torture room. Some of us, though, think about aviation a little differently. Small aircraft. The thrill of pulling back on the yoke as you reach V1. That's takeoff speed. Watching the Earth glide by below you quietly as you sense three-dimensional freedom of flight. No long lines, no traffic cops, and ladies, if the pilot wants to pat you down a little bit, be suspicious. It's probably not for security reasons. <laughs> anyway, that's called general aviation. Quite the experience. When I was growing up, it wasn't unusual to see people standing by the fence at your local airport, just standing there watching planes take off and land. Fathers there with their little ones, pointing out the wondrous sight, that little machine drifting over you, going to who knows where. Well, that was then, and today, not so much. It's a different world in, in so many different ways. Today, if you stand by that fence for any amount of time, you might get a visit from security, wondering if you're a threat. But some things don't change, thankfully. The romance of flying can still be there if you just have that sense of whatever you want to call it, adventure, fun, whatever you call it. General aviation is unique in this world, something that's hard to duplicate. What I call it, a rewarding experience. With me today to talk about the experience of general aviation is Norm Eisler, who is the Northeast Ambassador for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. And Norm, welcome to the show. Good morning, pleasure to be here. Uh, aviation, you know, I've been a pilot for a long time and, you know, it's always a thrill. Uh, you know, for me, I, I grew up with airplanes and, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm not a golfer, I'm not a fisherman. That's been my go-to for, for recreation, enjoyment, relaxation, whatever you want to call it. Um, people today, they, like I said in the intro, they, they think of aviation in different ways and uh, to a lot of our viewers who aren't familiar with general aviation, they wonder how expensive it is, how you get involved in it, uh, a little bit about, you know, what it takes, is, is it safe, you know, there's a lot of questions about aviation. Well, general aviation, it's a wonderful hobby, it's a great way to get around, it is definitely safe and it's a fascinating opportunity to learn new things and including learn new things about yourself. The one thing I'd like to point out is uh, as much as I find it uh, an exciting opportunity, I try and keep the thrill to a minimum <laughs> just to make sure that people understand that. Well, when you're, you know, when you're flying above, you know, the, the, the land at, at 2,000 or 3,000 feet, it is a different experience. And it, it's not like a roller coaster thrill, but no. it is certainly, uh, you know, something that you, you're going to enjoy. You bring up a very important point uh, when we travel commercially and we fly, you know, we're generally at 20 to 40,000 feet, uh, as opposed to when you and I fly in our little airplanes, as people call them, uh, we're usually a couple of thousand feet above ground level. We can see what's happening down there. We can actually see the people in the traffic. We can smell the smells. There's nothing greater than mm -hmm. flying over a hayfield or something like that, or someone having an outdoor barbecue. Uh, you can pick that up too. Yeah, it's, it, it is quite an experience. And you know, there's different kinds of flying when you're in a small airplane. You can be going somewhere, in which case you're you know, five, 6,000 feet and you're, you're traveling, you know, and you can experience the countryside much different than when you're in an airliner, uh, but you're still going somewhere in a nice, efficient way. And then you're, there's the recreational flying where you are a couple thousand feet and you're enjoying the countryside. You're just going out and punching holes in the sky, you know. Just a perfect example around here, probably all of your viewers at one point in time or another have been to Niagara Falls 
you and I have flown the racetrack 3,500 feet <laughs> up and had a wonderful view of the falls. You know, that was one of my favorite things to do when I was, uh, I got my uh, pilot's license pretty early and it was always exciting to uh, offer uh, a date. <laughs> hey, you want to see <laughs> Niagara Falls from a different angle? You know, that was uh, pretty unique. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, an interesting experience to say the least. But getting to today in general aviation, there is a, uh, a, from the business standpoint, airlines have a, a tremendous need for pilots. Absolutely. There's a very shortage of, of pilots. Boeing estimates that in the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to need something in the neighborhood of, uh, eight, what's the number, 200,000 pilots? Uh, yeah. It's a big number. Big number. And. Um, pilots are retiring uh, there is a mandatory retirement age so the pilots that trained in our generation they may have been ex-military pilots they're now reaching 65 which is the mandatory retirement age for airline pilots and we're not generating as many new pilots as we need while airline pilots are also coming up on retirement age we also have a situation that airlines are expanding and a need for more pilots while at the same time, we're generating less new pilots than it, it's, we need. It's a perfect situation if you're a young person looking for a tremendous career because there's, the benefits are wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good way to earn a living because um, you're not sitting behind a desk all day. Your desk is, you know, going from point A to point B and, and traveling, seeing the world. And, and having good responsibilities, and it's a very well-respected job. It's certainly a well-respected job. It takes a, a, a good bit of training. The great news is that today there are more opportunities. There's a true career path for what is always been and will continue to be a good-paying career uh, in the airlines. Um, as airlines have realized that the shortages, that there is such a shortage, the regional airlines have stepped up with new training programs, uh, increased starting pay and sign-on bonuses. If you get into aviation on a career basis, you are very, very likely to succeed in a career. And uh, in fact, uh, I just have to give this little plug here. It's something that AOPA is very involved in. We have actually created a high school curriculum to get kids excited about aviation and start them into that career path while they're still in high school. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about. You know, the, the, some people are wondering, I'm sure, who have kids out there or young people who may be watching now, how do I get involved? How expensive is it? How long does it take? There are a lot of common questions uh, mm -hmm. that I get asked a lot. Of, you know, can I afford it? How much time do I have to, dev to devote to it? And your program, the AOPA program, it's there for high school age kids, and it's going to help with expenses, it's going to encourage the interest. Well, our high school program is designed to be up to a four-year curriculum to get kids involved, interested, and involved into aviation. And if there are any high school administrators or parents out there that are interested, I'll be happy to talk more about this uh, offline. But the programs are designed to enter a student into one of two career paths, either working with drones and be prepared to start their own drone business at the end of high school, <clears throat> or be ready to pass the written exam for their private pilot license, which is pretty much the first step that most career pilots follow. AOPA has also additionally provided uh, grants, scholarships. Uh, we just awarded in the past uh, week or two um, a, a million dollars worth of scholarships to put high school students and some teachers through flight training to help them get through that first step into aviation. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, of a mystery to people, you know, because it is so different. Um, it's, it's not um, a common thing mm -hmm. that, that people experience. Uh, and, and so there, those questions, uh, they need to be answered. People have the interest. I'm, I, a lot of people are curious about it. Now, the expense involved is often a topic, and I usually tell people who ask me, flying is not cheap, but if you're going to be a golfer or if you're going to be a boater, if you're going to be playing uh, you know, 
again, uh, with any kind of a, a regularity and skiing, uh, the, almost any pastime that you get involved in today is going to involve expense. Yep. If, you're, if you're going to be uh, interested in it, there's certainly a significant investment to be made, both in time, um, whether you if you're starting training for the license, for example, there's going to be some classroom investment. There's going to be some time learning the rules and the regulations and weather and uh, airspace and all of these things, which are done through what's called ground school. Then there's also going to be a minimum amount of time spent in the aircraft. Generally speaking, a private pilot license has a minimum of 40 hours in the aircraft, half of that with an instructor, half of it by yourself uh, doing what's called solo work and every bit of it is a learning experience. There is, of course, an expense uh, with it. As you pointed out, whether it's motorcycles or boating, it's probably a similar cost, but motorcycles and boating don't have the career path in front of you that you have uh, with aviation. Um, I've dealt with some young people that have started uh, locally doing their basic training. Uh, I just talked to one mother yesterday, or two days ago, her son went down to Florida to Embry-Riddle. He's a student there full time, and he just passed his instrument ratings. So he'll he's well on his weird way to being a career pilot. And uh, again, it's a great career opportunity. And there, there are, we, we're running out of time in this segment, but I'm just gonna briefly talk about there are ways to make it an efficient process in learning. Mm -hmm. And that is you, you find an instructor who you can communicate with well, and you do, your instructions as often as you can because yep. you know when I took instructions I would take a couple of instructions a couple of hours a week because if you drag it out and and don't go back for two or three weeks then you have to spend a portion of your time reviewing what you did in the past mm -hmm. and and you basically waste 15 minutes out of that hour just you know trying to refresh yourself there's there's definitely a positive to training often, uh, building what I refer to as muscle memory. If you were to try and learn how to ride a bicycle and you got on there once for 20 minutes and then you waited three weeks before you got on again, you're gonna be redoing a whole bunch of stuff over again. The important thing if you start flying is find a school that you like, an instructor that you like. It's very important everybody learns a little differently. So while one person might be a great instructor for me, they may not be so good for a younger person or a young lady or whatever. Find someone you're comfortable with that teaches the same way that you learn. There are a number of flight schools right here in Buffalo. There's more in the Rochester area. Uh, there are also flying clubs, which offer another opportunity for uh, learning how to fly and becoming a skilled pilot. Well, it's, it's kind of a mystery, you know, if you don't know, you haven't been involved in it, but there are answers. It doesn't need to be a mystery, and people can contact you. The AOPA is there to help, right. and we'll we're, have information we're, that we can put on the screen. They can yep. contact you. We're going to take a break now. We'll, we'll put that information on the screen. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the process, some of the events that are coming up this summer. Sounds great. Lots lot to talk about. It. Good stuff. We'll be back right after this.